Hai Sobat Milenial, kembali lagi di program Ambassador Talk bersama saya Sonya Mikaela. Saat ini saya sudah berada di kediaman Duta Besar Rusia di Jakarta dan sudah bersama saya Duta Besar Rusia untuk Indonesia, Ibu Lyudmila Vorobieva. Good morning, Ambassador. Good morning. Thank you for your time and thank you for having me here. So, Mr. Ambassador, uh, it has been then six months of the Russian military operation in Ukraine. So how is the condition now and how is the progress of diplom diplomatic talks between R Russia and Ukraine? Yes, indeed, it has been six months. The operation uh, is progressing steadily and we have no doubt that uh, we will reach our goals. Uh, and the goals are for the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. Uh, as for the talks, uh, Unfortunately, uh, they were stopped and they were stopped by the Ukrainian side. The last round of talks uh, was in April, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and since then the Ukrainian side refuses to come back uh, to the uh, negotiations uh, and uh, what we see that they are very much uh, instigated by Western, their Western partners, uh, which call on Ukraine to continue the war uh, until uh, a military victory is uh, reached. Of course, it's an absolutely unrealistic uh, goal. So the question is uh, why the government uh, in Kiev uh, is uh, uh, sacrificing uh, their own people to please uh, the West and to try to reach this absolutely unrealistic uh, goal. Uh, so uh, we will be ready to resume the dialogue uh, with uh, Kiev uh, to discuss uh, actually the conditions that uh, Russia is uh, setting on Ukraine. Okay, so Ukraine said they were taking back their territory in Kherson, if I'm not mistaken, and has urged Russian troops to flee from there. So, uh, is it near the end of the military operation because Ukraine taking back their territory or? Of course not. First of all, they didn't take uh, the, the territory. They tried to launch an offensive, uh, but they are failing. There are still actions uh, going on, but it's absolutely clear that uh, this will not happen. And uh, in a sense, uh, the, this offensive was more in the information area than in, in real life. And uh, of course, uh, Kherson will not be taken back uh, by the Ukrainians. And uh, actually why they are launching this, uh, they have launched this offensive, because uh, the people of uh, Kherson uh, have uh, uh, stated that they want to uh, organize a referendum uh, on uh, these areas to join Russia. So uh, the purpose of this uh, offensive is to prevent uh, this from happening and uh, Kiev is uh, blackmailing also the population in this uh, area saying that if uh, they will attend the referendum, if they will uh, express their will during the referendum, they could be uh, subject to criminal persecution up to 12 years uh, in, uh, in jail, which uh, of course is absolutely absurd. But again, um, the offensive by Ukraine is failing and of course Kherson will not go back to Ukraine uh, as the result of this uh, of this offense. Uh, about the humanitarian access, so is it true that Ukraine doesn't approve the humanitarian access? Oh yes, that's absolutely true. You know, since the beginning of the uh, operation, uh, Russia uh, was trying to uh, open humanitarian passages for the civilians to be able to leave the areas of uh, military actions and uh, what we have seen that Ukraine was preventing it from happening. Uh, they were even killing people who were trying to go through this uh, humanitarian uh, passages. That's, that's the way they operate. They don't spare 
uh, their own uh, people. Uh, on the other side, uh, in Russia, um, some people are even asking why the military operation is progressing uh, not as quickly as it could happen. And um, the question is, of course, that one of the reasons is that we're trying to spare the civilian population, uh, you know, if we look at how, for instance, uh, the Americans uh, did during their uh, numerous military operations, they just bombed everything, destroyed everything first from the, uh, the carpet bombings and then the troops come in, everything destroyed, civilians killed, civilian infrastructure uh, destroyed. That's not how uh, Russia is doing it. We're trying to spare uh, people, simple people, who are victims in this tragedy, of course, because we see Ukrainians as our brothers and sisters. Uh, they are they're the same, actually. They're the same people. So um, it is true, and uh, again, that highlights the criminal essence of the regime in Kiev. They don't uh, spare their own people. In this conflict, so what do you think about um, West countries' role that helping Ukraine to against Russia? The role is uh, crucial, I would say, because uh, unfortunately in this conflict, uh, Ukraine is not the actor, it's a victim. It's the victim uh, of uh, Western policies and also uh, the victim of uh, their own government, uh, which is the puppet uh, of, of West, of Brussels and Washington. They just do what uh, their Western allies uh, tell them uh, to do. And uh, also what we see the West, instead of urging Ukraine to engage uh, in talks with Russia, uh, they are instigating Ukraine to try uh, to win military, and it's impossible. And everyone understands that. So, uh, you know, we, we say in Russia that the West is, is ready to fight against Russia until the last Ukrainian. And it, it's a tragedy, again, from, for Ukrainian people. Uh, which are victims again of this uh, also criminal policies of Kyiv regime and instigated by, by the West, by US, NATO and, and their allies. Uh, how about the many, many sanctions drop uh, on Russia? Is it, rough, is it uh, better the Russia economy and trade? Uh, Sanctions, of course, are absolutely illegal. This is an uh, absolute violation of every uh, norm and rule of uh, international law, of uh, international trade regulation, WTO, uh, because the only body in the world uh, that has the right to impose sanctions uh, is the Security Council of the UN and any u unilateral uh, sanctions are absolutely illegitimate and they don't work and they don't work in in many uh, senses first of all uh, what is actually the object of sanctions to make the government change its policies has it made the government change its policy no any if you look at previous you know cases uh, Russia is not the first country that is under sanctions like Iran or Venezuela or Cuba for more than 60 years has it made any government change its policies? Actually, no. Uh, on, a, on, a more, on a deeper level, again, and it's openly stated by the Western leaders that the sanctions are, uh, the target of the sanction is to make people suffer so that they will uh, be opposed uh, against its own, their own government and, and then change the government. Is it happening in Russia? No. Uh, according to the surveys of public opinion, uh, more than 80% of uh, Russians uh, support uh, what we're doing in Ukraine and support President Putin. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that they're not affecting the economy. Of course uh, they are, but not to the extent uh, that uh, maybe those who imposed uh, this sanction wished uh, them to, to, to do. 
uh, you know, I came back from Moscow uh, a week and a half uh, ago. I spent four, four or five weeks in Moscow, and uh, you know, life is normal. Life is normal. Of course, the prices are a little bit higher than they used to be because they are more. Uh, there are more uh, logistical difficulties now to bring the goods uh, to Russia, but uh, what we produce in Russia, and we do produce practically you know, everything we need, and, and first of all we produce energy and food, we are self-sufficient. You go to a Moscow shop, you will find anything. I mean food, you know, a supermarket, you will find everything, I mean, diary, bread, uh, cheese, I don't know, meat. There is no lack of uh, supply for uh, Russians. Uh, of course, things would have been even better without the sanctions, but uh, Russian economy proved to be resilient and uh, the government policies also helped to uh, reduce the impact uh, from from the sanctions, but uh, you know, uh, you look at the map. You know, Russia is the biggest country in the world. We have a huge territory. Uh, we have a well-educated population. We have industries. We have technologies. Uh, okay, if we we don't import something, uh, I'm sure uh, in a, you know middle middle term we will. Uh, uh, we will produce uh, our own. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm not telling that we want to self-isolate, and we're not, mm. because uh, we have uh, many partners uh, in the world, uh, including ASEAN, Indonesia, of course, uh, Latin American, African countries uh, that are very willing to uh, cooperate to Russia that have not imposed uh, any sanctions uh, against Russia, so our economy is uh, adjusting to this uh, new situation and uh, hopefully we will do even better in the time to come. Okay, uh, we move to bilateral uh, relation between Russia and Indonesia. Uh, what do you think about the last visit of our president? Uh, Joko Widodo to Moscow and uh, meet your president Vladimir Putin and uh, Indonesia called uh, the visit as a peace mission to uh, the conflict of Russia and Ukraine. Well, uh, of course we appreciate very much uh, the efforts of uh, President Widodo uh, in, in this situation but and, unfortunately the Ukrainian side is not willing. Uh, th that's the problem. Uh, and the visit uh, by President Widodo to Moscow and his uh, talks to uh, our president were very good. Uh, and uh, the reaction I, uh, uh, I heard about in Moscow when I was, as I told you, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, our president is very happy with the visit uh, and uh, with the uh, intention of uh, Indonesian uh, leader to uh, promote cooperation with our country uh, and again we're also very appreciative of the position of Indonesia as the G20 uh, chairman uh, inviting our president to come uh, to the G20 summit. I can tell you that we are participating in the majority of G20 um, meetings, uh, as you know, our Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, was recently in July in, in Bali for the G20 ministerial meeting and uh, uh, the Speaker of our Parliament, Mrs. Matvijanka, is also intends to come for the parliamentary meeting of the uh, G20 countries in uh, October. Uh, so, uh, the visit was a great success. Uh, in, in terms of bilateral uh, uh, relations, uh, unfortunately for the uh, Ukrainian situation, uh, it all comes to the position of Ukraine and the Western, uh, their Western allies that actually they don't allow Ukraine to engage in any uh, peace talks uh, with Russia. Okay. Uh, about 
according to Indonesia presidency and G20, uh, will be President Putin come <laughs> to G20 <laughs> summit this year? Uh, the only thing I can say that uh, the invitation has been issued yeah. and we are very grateful for that. Uh, the reply from President Putin that he intends to come okay. in person but uh, there are still many considerations to be taken in account. Mm -hmm. uh, the recent uh, statement by the press secretary of uh, the president was that also the uh, considerations of security should be taken in account and how the operation in Ukraine uh, develops, how the COVID situation uh, is. Uh, so we will see. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, the last but not least, mm -hmm. uh, may you explain, uh, according to the last visit of President Joko Widodo to Moscow, uh, is there any new cooperation between uh, Indonesia and Russia? Well, uh, actually, uh, we have. Uh, many areas that we can uh, work uh, together uh, and it, it's not only trade uh, and of course uh, we are ready also to supply uh, energy uh, to uh, i mean oil uh, to uh, indonesia uh, agricultural products of course uh, fertilizers uh, despite all the sanctions and all the difficulties uh, we hope that uh, the flow will go on uh, of this kind of goods. Uh, uh, actually, what the president suggested uh, it was discussed during the bilateral meeting that uh, our uh, companies and government uh, agencies should look at um, the building of the new capital, for instance, uh, Nusantara, because, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Jakarta and Moscow, they are uh, sister cities. And uh, actually recently a delegation from the government of Moscow participated in one of the G20 uh, meetings on urban development. Uh, and uh, again, uh, they, they are ready to look how we can uh, participate uh, in, in this project. Uh, we have uh, uh, technologies of uh, smart city. You know, in Moscow, uh, I come once a year uh, for vacation and every time I see changes for the best in Moscow. For instance, now uh, we have a lot of uh, electrical vehicles, buses okay. trans used for public transportation. Okay. So as we hear, the Nusantara project is a green project, so probably this kind of technologies and uh, how you can turn uh, the um, public transportation uh, to being green, uh, we can look, look at that smart city technologies. Um, you know, in Moscow also, uh, we have a, a great system of underground uh, uh, transportation. Uh, which is being expanded uh, every year. Every year we have new stations and new lines uh, being built. So uh, I think uh, our experience in infrastructure, uh, in transportation could be used uh, while uh, uh, implementing the Nusantara uh, project. Uh, also, we can look at cooperation in energy, including nuclear energy. Um, shipbuilding, commercial uh, aircraft uh, building, um, pharmaceuticals, okay. uh, and many others. We have a great potential of cooperation, of course. Uh, how about the people to people connection? Uh, uh, absolutely, this is also an area that uh, we uh, we have contacts in this area. Uh, we, provi we provide uh, scholarships for Indonesian students, the government okay. of Russia. Uh, uh, the number of scholarships um, has been increased to 261 uh, from 161, but uh, we are trying to have more because we see a big demand for education in Russia. 
uh, now we have uh, around 700 Indonesian students in, in Russia. I've seen some of them uh, in Moscow uh, because the uh, embassy of uh, Indonesia uh, has organized a very beautiful celebration of the Independence Day on the 17th August in one of the central parks of uh, Moscow. There was a, a cultural festival and many of the students who uh, at, who study in Moscow, they attended uh, this festival and I can tell you it attracted a big crowd of visitors. Uh, the, the, this park was just full of uh, people who came to see. There were was performances of dancers and singers from Indonesia. Uh, and some products on sale, so it was an absolutely wonderful uh, uh, event. Uh, uh, the other uh, thing, uh, of course, are uh, tourist exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that Russians just love Bali. Before COVID, we had 160,000 Russian tourists mm -hmm. per year. Uh, since uh, the government of Indonesia decisions to grant visa on arrival for Russian uh, tourists, we also see an increase of uh, number of Russians going uh, to Bali. And uh, we're sure that uh, it, there will be even more uh, Russians. And, and we are also ready to uh, welcome uh, tourists from uh, Indonesia. Uh, despite uh, you know everything, uh, Moscow and Russia is a very safe place. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Uh, and uh, there are so many things to see in Russia. Of course, Moscow is a beautiful city. Saint Petersburg is a fantastic city. But also uh, for our Muslim friends, uh, we have Muslim regions like Tatarstan, with the beautiful capital, Kazan. I've never been to Kazan, but everyone who visited mm -hmm. says it's just an amazing place. Uh, uh, so um, we're ready to welcome more uh, tourists uh, from Indonesia. Okay, so uh, Russian absolutely loves Indonesian. <laughs> Oh yes, <laughs> you, you ask anyone in the street in, uh, in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg uh, what the first word comes to your mind if you say Indonesia, Bali. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, uh, Indonesia is much more than Bali. Yeah. You have so many beautiful places, just fantastic. Bali is wonderful, but you know, I've, I've, I've visited many regions of Indonesia, and including Sulawesi, Sumatra, Kalimantan, and every uh, region I, or area I visited, just, just so beautiful, people are so nice. So I hope more Russians will come to Indonesia, and not only to Bali, but to other places as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your time. Uh, sekian wawancara saya dengan Ibu Duta Besar Rusia untuk Indonesia, Ibu Ludmila Vorobieva, dan sampai jumpa di Ambassador Talk episode berikutnya.